Good morning, Facebook Live. This is Robin Carbigado. Welcome to today. It is going to be an amazing day. As you join in, know that God is just going to strengthen and encourage you in the word of truth as our heart is repentant. Amen. Oh my goodness. God has got such a word that has strength to it. And it is going to revive the soul. We're going to look at repentance today. And God is just going to show us the great anointing of repentance. And, you know, Jesus declaring, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Amen. Hey, Linda Thorne, God bless you. Thank you for joining in. So awesome to have you. And as you join in, oh my goodness, you know, it's so amazing. We have, um, I'm pulling up a scripture, just FYI. Uh, I'm pulling up Matthew 4, 17, looking at the strong concordance of the Greek. As we get into the Greek meaning of the kingdom of heaven is at hand, you're going to see that very deeply in chapter 3 and chapter 4 of the forbidden fruit, the spiritual dis-ease. Hey, Margaret. Hey, Dina. Thank y'all for joining in. And so the Holy Spirit just really put on my heart this morning about repentance and about worldliness, just showing me the busyness of this world, the stress that it can bring, the distractions that really steal from our seeking holiness and righteousness. You know, we're to seek peace and holiness without which no one will see God. And you know, one of the messages the anointing that I walk in from the Lord is, of course, repentance, which comes with sifting. And along with that is the healing of the soul. That's really the two anointings that I walk in with the Lord. And it's something I have lived over and over and experienced. And so we're going to look at God strengthening us in the word of truth as we cleanse our garments today. Amen. We cleanse ourselves of all worldliness. We just cast off the world. And God keeps telling me more and more scriptures. We cast off the world, amen, and all the things of the world. And we put on the light of Christ Jesus, amen. So I've got my laptop and I've got my Bible. And we're going to get into scripture today as Holy Spirit keeps bringing me scripture and we're going to just see the healing of the soul where God's word divides between your intents and motives and goes really, really deep. And we're going to look at really getting into that place of holiness and righteousness. Amen. You know, so many Christians, they think they're okay. And as God had me teaching this past summer on walking with wisdom, as I've been writing this forbidden fruit, the spiritual disease, that we always think that the church of Laodicea in Revelation 3 are those people. And God just really brought a anointing of the spirit of the fear of the Lord and showed me that the church of Laodicea are us. And we don't realize it. And you might think, Robin, wait a minute. I'm not cold. Well, wait a minute. Let us get deep in scripture. And God just keeps bringing to me as well about the revivals. And this is what you have to understand about revival. Because, you know, when we look at repentance, which we're going to look at in a minute in Matthew 4, 17. When we look at repentance, we always think, okay, you know, Lord, I repent, I repent, I repent and do it daily. Let me tell you about repentance. Okay, It is where the fear of the Lord comes on you so strong that you are brought to your knees because you have a vision of hell and how close you are to it. Because like Isaiah in Isaiah 6, who was a most righteous man in his time, the glory of God has come upon you and you see the uncleanliness that you were totally clueless about and you hit your knees and you are begging to not die, that will bring a repentance as God shows you your own heart by what comes out of your mouth. And we don't realize how careless we are, the attitudes we have. And like God showed me today, when I write the post that I put out on Facebook 
I'm not thinking, okay, I'm going to write this. I'm going to do this. The Holy Spirit just stirs me. And the Holy Spirit says, start writing, Robin, about this. And then the next thing I know is that there is a development of what is on the Father's heart coming out on that post that I did not expect. And the whole purpose is to help others, to point others to Christ Jesus, to repentance and walking in the narrow way. And so we're going to look at that today to make sure, you know, that we're cleansing ourselves of the things of, all, of the world. And as in the Shantung, Shantung revival in China that went a decade, okay, in this revival, as well as in other revivals in China, literally the young kids had visions of hell and they were repenting and they were just caught in such conviction of the Holy Spirit. And they were just wailing and repenting, as well as in the Shantung revival, that people were wailing and repenting. Hey, friend. And then also in the island of Timor, and that revival, let me pull that up as well. Uh, the island of Timor in 1965, and that revival... When the glory of God comes, it is going to look like Acts 5, like Ananias and Sapphira. And the reason that that level of glory hasn't come to the church is because a lot of people would be dead. They would be dead because they think they're okay and they're not okay. Whatever is in the heart is not what comes into the mouth that defiles the body. It's what comes out of the mouth that contaminates the whole body. And so this is known as fruit. And in Mindfulness Mind of Christ, in that book that is on Amazon, I do two chapters on the language of fruit in the spiritual realm, unpacking physics and the supernatural realm, paranormal realm, so that you can see the language of your fruit and what's happening in the invisible realm and how it has effect around your members and inside of you. And so if you have feelings like the language of fruit is feelings, reading, intuitiveness, having that intuitiveness and understanding of what's going on in the spirit realm and walking in truth that causes us to yield good fruit. Amen. And so, in the 1965 revival in Timor, and in the Shantung revival that went from 1937 to 1947, let me make sure about the dates, 1927 to 1937, there's deep repentance. Deep repentance. People are on their face, breathing in pain. And you said, where is that in the... Scripture, I was in Isaiah 66. When the glory of God comes in that measure, it, and it's also in Micah 4, it is powerful to expose sin nature in the vessel so that we confess our sins, get it out of our vessel, and we're filled with joy. We're filled with the anointing. We're lifted up. And so people were publicly, in both revivals, publicly confessing their sin. And as God showed me today, which I wanted to get back to because Holy Spirit's bringing this point, so many times we are so wounded and offended. And if others have truly repented and they have fruits of repentance, we can still project our own woundedness and badness on others, saying that we need to stay away from them when instead as Dr. Henry Cloud and John Townsend show in Safe People that those type of people are toxic, okay? The people that want to make you out as bad and feel like they need to protect themselves from you and you've walked in true repentance, you've sought repentance, or let's say somebody else is seeking repentance with you, you know, if you're still having a, and God told me this morning that People have a potty mouth. It's not cussing that God's talking about. It is talking about just like I mentioned yesterday, poo on the shoe. 
And in my memories today was 1 Samuel 2, 8, which is also a workbook title that I wrote, Can You Handle the Truth? Now, a lot of people can handle the truth. And in 1 Samuel 2, 8, Hannah's praise is that you lift up the needy from the ash heap, from the dung hill, and sit them in a throne of glory fit for nobility. And there was that dung gate. And in my memories today was that scripture along with last year, me reposting it and saying that with all this poop, there has to be a pony. That was the walking with wisdom I did over a year ago, apparently. And so I learned that in law school, taking property law, where you don't just do law books, but you also do study aids, which are workbooks, as well as audio supplements, and the professor that was teaching property law as I was preparing for the baby bar in California to go fly out there and take that so that I could stay in law school because only the top 25% that pass it are able to stay in law school. And so, and eight, actually 800 plus took it that year and God put me in the top 4%. And it's not because I'm brilliant, believe me. It is not because I'm brilliant because I'm not, I'm just radically obedient. And so, the property law professor was using the analogy in property law about two kids. One of them has all these toys, all these gifts from the parents. The other one has just poop all in their room. And that the parents went into the child's room that had all the toys. And they were just unappreciative, ungrateful, and saying that they didn't get what they wanted to get. And they could not see what they had. Whereas the other child that had the poop was shoveling the manure and the parents and smiling and the parents said why are you so happy and they said with all of this poop manure there has to be a pony and so we're going to look at getting rid of worldliness because the first child in that room had all these gifts and didn't appreciate one thing that's worldliness and worldliness is not just about getting things. It is not just coveting the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of and the pride of life. And it's making yourself God and judging others as though you are God and you know better and everybody else is bad. And you have to be protected from everybody else because they're so bad. And when you get into that space, there's going to be another spirit, which I heard the audible voice of God in 2012, tell me about in January at our 22 is 22 meeting that year. I had not ever heard of it. I'd had dreams for years. I didn't know what the dreams meant. And it wasn't until God spoke to me and told me the name of the spirit. And he told me to look it up. Came to Lenny. It's the serpent in the spine. Look it up. That I then came across Andrew Strom and his video on YouTube at that time, exposing the Kundalini spirit and saw as John Melindy. Also, just a month after that, I came across John Melindy's testimony about his uh, pretty much encounter like a road to Damascus encounter, except he's been a minister. And Jesus visited him twice. And in the second visit, the first visit was to get him to repent and show John his own heart, very much like Isaiah 6. And Jesus told John Melindy at that time, if I came today, you would not have come with me. You would not have been taken with me because you're not ready. Your, your mind is full of filth. You have filth all around you. And this was John Melindy, okay? A very powerful visit with the glory of Jesus Christ, the King of glory, that kind of visitation. And so after John repented, and he told his team what the Lord showed him of their deep sins. Then Jesus visited him a second time. And Jesus told him three things that the father was grieved about. The first, that there was so much woundedness and people not appropriated the fullness of salvation. And so there was much backbiting. The second was that people created their own spiritual experiences. And they ascribed God's name to it. And it wasn't God. And it was not his Holy Spirit. And so when you're living in woundedness and bitterness and you feel like you have to be protected from everybody, it's you can get in a dangerous space of being deceived and being open to and susceptible to 
the Kundalini spirit, which I've done extensive notes on, both in exposing it and in deliverance. And so, the Lord really wants to bring a message of repentance today and just come back to this later if you're not ready for it right now, and that is a-okay. And then, you know, come back to it when you're ready. But for those that are ready now, we're going to get into scripture and we're going to get deep. And just FYI, I'm going to be bringing other teachings later on in the week that are for the physical temple and really get into psychobiotics in the gut-brain axis and start with sourdough bread and get back to that lactobacillus bacteria that, that is a psychobiotic that some of your issues, your behaviors, your moods can not just be hormones, but can also be because of your microbiome being totally messed up and say, so we're going to do the whole person, okay? So let's get into it, amen? Matthew 4, 17, Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus and both Luke 4 and Matthew 4 at the beginning, after he's been baptized in the river Jordan to fulfill all righteousness, a baptism that we see in Matthew 3 that was totally different than the baptism you and I have. The baptism you and I have is a baptism of repentance. Jesus didn't need to repent. He's pure, holy. His baptism was to fulfill all righteousness and indicated Holy Spirit coming on mankind to endow and do mankind, the tent, with power. And that's when the Holy Spirit came down like a dove. And those who had ears to hear could hear God the Father say, This is my beloved Son, and whom I'm well pleased. And then Holy Spirit led Christ, Jesus, the anointed one, Christos, into the wilderness to overcome the lust of the eyes, the lust of the f flesh, and the pride of life. So the wilderness represents, and you're going to see that in chapter 6, as never before, in the forbidden fruit, the spiritual disease, and demons. And what happens to demons, oppressive spirits, when they leave your members, where do they go? How does this look like? What is laid out in Scripture in relation for us to see it effectively done by the Holy Spirit so that we are in concert with truth and that we are walking in truth instead of those that are deliverance ministers, that instead of doing true deliverance, there is oppressive, more oppressive spirits coming on people and much of it can present itself as demonic which is what the Lord showed me when he had me throw out books that I had gotten on deliverance because every time I bought that book and would bring it into my house, demons would show up in my house. And so the mindfulness, the mind of Christ is a true deliverance book of John 8, 32 through 36. You shall know the truth. The truth shall set you free. Whom the Son sets free, Christ Jesus sets free, is free indeed. And so that's the intro into true deliverance and the consecrated body and the transformed mind. Romans 12, 1, Romans 12, 2. And so the forbidden fruit, the spiritual disease is a sequel to mindfulness, my Christ. And it's really going to show you physics and the supernatural and what's going on with the body. What is going on with the two kingdoms on earth, the kingdom of heaven, then with the fall came the kingdom of the world, which Satan rules over with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which we're being purged of with the carnal nature. And we're walking in by the Holy Spirit, being spirit led, walking in the power of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus comes out of the wilderness, overcoming it. And his message to the church that would be is repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so let's go to this word repent in Greek. And let's look at this and break it down from the Strong's Concordance, which is met an aio, met an aio. And it means to change one's mind by the Blue Letter Bible. But let's look at the Strong's Concordance. It means to think differently, to reconsider, to repent. And it comes from two words, meta which is in many Greek words, 
which means with, after, behind. And then it comes from the word, the second Greek word from which it comes from is no, noio, noio, and kind of like annoy. If you're annoyed, then you might need to meta noio, okay? So noio means to perceive. It means to exercise the mind. It means to heed, consider. It means to understand. It means to comprehend. And so understand you don't get delivered from the brain down to the body, which mindfulness, my mind Christ, really unpacks at the G-protein coupled receptor level, which that whole book is about the G-protein coupled receptor level. This new book, The Forbidden Fruit, The Spiritual Disease, brings in, in chapter three, the morphogenetic field and shows you that field in relation to spiritual things in the two kingdoms, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of the world on earth and what's going on in those two kingdoms and how your soul, your identity, attaches to either one of those kingdoms and what the wrestling match is in relation to the human soul on earth and overcoming the, the powers of darkness. And it also brings in DNA methylation, the vagus nerve with the microbiome and the gut brain axis, as well as uh, the PTSD. And so there's a lot. And also the fourth dimension, chapter four is of the fourth dimension. And that's what I'm halfway through right now. And so there's a lot of science being brought into that. And it is because the father, God himself, is bringing comprehension of what true repentance looks like. So let's just get into the basics. There's two kingdoms. Heaven was first when God created the earth. And then after the fall, another kingdom was formed. And that kingdom was the kingdom of the world. The whole purpose was to hijack mankind's intent. Okay? That was the whole purpose. Satan could not bring that kingdom into earth, on earth, unless he hijacked mankind's intention. That's what happened in the garden with Eve, with Adam. He hijacked their intention at the receptor level, G protein couple receptor, eyes, ear, smell, taste, that your eyes would be open, your senses would be pakal, Genesis 3, open, Genesis 3, 5, Genesis 3, 7. So their, their senses were opened in the body. And information of a new kingdom, like Lucifer, who then became Satan and fell, Lucifer brought that knowledge up into heaven. But God is spirit. God was not flesh up there. And so that information was cast out of heaven by God as he threw Satan out. And so it was different for Adam and Eve having that same knowledge of evil because they had a body. And the information was added to the body, which then brought death to the body. And so God brought redemption through Christ Jesus in order to cleanse our body, to consecrate the body and bring us back to that place of reconciliation to the Father and to turn away. And this is why I'm saying all of this to really understand repentance. Repentance is to turn away from the world. That's what repentance is. It is to turn away from the kingdom of the world. And so only Holy Spirit can show us that a dead man on a tree, Jesus Christ on the cross, is the way to salvation. So when Holy Spirit shows us, we have a hunger and thirst of righteousness. We repent. We have a true sorrow of being attached to the world. And so we turn away from the world. And we turn towards the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And then, of course, Matthew 5, the Beatitudes, but especially Matthew 5, 6, we seek and hunger for righteousness. And by that we're filled, and that is the cleansing of the garments, is being hungry and thirsty for righteousness, and then we're filled. And so, this particular word, when we look at repentance, it means that we have had a comprehension, we have had an understanding, because whatever you understand is what fruit is going to be operative in your body. You know, be glad you don't understand sin, 
Because if you understand it, that would be pretty scary because that would mean that your body is seizing it and comprehending it and you're walking in that information that's been added to you. We are being John 15 too, purged, pruned, katharos, the Greek word, of that which is unholy, that which is unclean. Amen. And so let's look at some scriptures today that Holy Spirit put on my heart. And as I did Matthew 6 leading up to Pentecost, God wants me to do now Matthew 7. Matthew 6 and Matthew 7 should be massive foundational pillars in the Christian faith. Every minister, every pastor, every preacher, every teacher needs to have this foundational teaching to those that are under their shepherding to really get this teaching out so that people have understanding because it's about your fruit. And we're going to see in Matthew 7 that you can be acting like you love God and saying it from your mouth and acting like it from the flesh, but deep within the heart, there is no consecration. There is uncleanliness and there is iniquity. That's what it is. That there's iniquity. So let's look at Matthew 7, verse 1 out of the Amplified Classic. Do not judge and criticize and condemn others. Whoa! Stop there. <laughs> Jesus himself, after he talks about how to cleanse yourself from the world, all of Matthew 6, and I've got that teaching, give, fast, pray, give, pray, and fast. After he does that, get yourself cleansed of the world. Then he starts off Matthew 7, do not judge, criticize, condemn others so that you may not be judged and criticized and condemned yourselves. And so Jesus is saying, listen, there is a trap that once you cleanse yourself of the world, there's a trap and it's always going to show up initially in your judgment of other people. This is why you're to reach out to those that are God's leading you to, that you're leading to holiness and righteousness in the word of truth if they have backslidden. But it says to really guard yourself, guard your garments so that your garments, you're not defiled and caught up in that same issue. And it all starts with judging because whatever you judge others of is what is in you. It is called projection. It is when your heart is attached in some areas to the kingdom of the world and everything's good and bad. People are good and bad. No, only Jesus Christ is good in you and Satan is bad. Satan is evil. And so this recipe comes in the presentation of judging, okay? And judging means that you have carnality in your members and you need to repent. And so, do not judge, criticize, condemn others so that you may not be judged and criticized and condemn yourselves. For just as you judge and criticize and condemn others, you'll be judged and criticized and condemned. And in accordance with the measure you use to deal out to others, it will be dealt out to you again, again to you. And so, the first thing in relation to my first book, Glory to Glory Sisterhood, the pink and silver and black cover. I talk about judging others in that book. I do a whole chapter on judging and that Holy Spirit showed me many years ago, two decades ago, that some trials I might be in could have been brought on by my judgment of others. And so Holy Spirit taught me from the Father to make sure, examine my heart, and see if I've judged someone else, and if I have, repent, and then immediately the trial would stop. But some trials are just trials for the refining of your faith. So let's look at verse 3. Why do you stare from without at the very small particle that is in your brother's eye, but do not become aware of and consider the beam of timber that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me Get the tiny particle out of the eye when there is a beam of timber in your own eye. You hypocrite, first get the timber out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the tiny particle out of your brother's eye. Do not give that which is holy, sacred to the dogs, 
Do not throw your pearls before hogs, lest they trample upon them with their feet and turn and tear you into pieces. And so let's look at this and just stop right here. Jesus is telling us first, look, repent. The log that's in your eye is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The kingdom of the world and it's influencing you and the influence of it in your heart is how you look at others. Are you impatient? Are you easily offended? Are you unforgiving? Are you thinking bad things about other people all the time? This is evidence, okay, that we need to repent. And then Jesus goes on to say, do not give that which is holy to the dogs. And so the Lord is instructing us, look, not everybody has the repentance of Holy Spirit. And you can speak about repentance to them in areas of their soul in which they need to repent after you cleansed your garments and make sure that you're not judging others, but that your heart motives in admonishment in the word of truth that brings correction. It is there in the gentleness of the Lord and that it's going to bring correction and it's going to bring the thorough cleansing, catharos, the purging that's needed in order that they get that which is of the kingdom of the world out of their members. But those people who will not receive the correction of the Lord, they're going to trample that word, the pearls, the revelation that the Holy Spirit's given you. And they're going to gnash their teeth. They're not going to be happy. And so that's what Jesus is telling us, that those that truly have a repentant heart, that they're going to be appreciative of that correction they're going to take it to heart and they're going to get into that place to where they let the word of truth do a thorough work in their members and cleanse themselves, cleanse their garments. Amen. And then God through Christ tells us verse seven, keep on asking and it will be given you. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking reverently and the door will be open for everyone who keeps on asking receives and he who keeps on seeking finds. And to him who keeps on knocking, the door will be opened. Or what man is there, if his son asks him for a loaf of bread, will he hand him a stone? Or if he asks him for a fish, will he be handed a serpent? If you then, evil as you are, know how to give good and advantageous gifts to your children, how much more will the Father who is in heaven, perfect as he is, give good and advantageous things to those who keep on asking him? So then, whatever you desire that others would do to you and for you, even do to them also and for them, for this sums up the law of the prophets. So let's look at this section and let's see what Christ is saying. Christ is saying, once you've cleansed your garment, once you've gotten a log out of your eye, as God had me write about extensively in chapter 3 of Mindfulness, Mind of Christ, that he pours out his Holy Spirit on the consecrated place. And that is why you have to be mindful because so many people think they are endowed and endued with power from Holy Spirit when instead it's a spirit of Kundalini. It's a counterfeit because they have the world in their heart. They're in unforgiveness. They're in judgment and they are not consecrated. Just like Elijah repairing the altar in 1 Kings 18, he repaired the altar that was broken and that repairing represents the consecrated body and that God pours his Holy Spirit only on the consecrated body, the clean place. And so Jesus is telling us, listen, when you cleanse yourself of the kingdom of the world, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking for the power of Holy Spirit and the power of Holy Spirit will be given to you. And Holy Spirit is going to help keep you clean. Holy Spirit is going to protect you. And Holy Spirit is going to help you stay in that narrow way. Amen. And so immediately, Scripture says after that, showing us what Holy Spirit is going to do. So, uh, so then, whatever you desire, others would do for you, then do also for them. So Holy Spirit is going to have you... Be like Christ in nature and character to others, where you have good motives, pure motives, clean hands, and a pure heart. Turn your cheek, love your enemy, bless those who curse you. That is what Holy Spirit is going to do. He's going to give you strength beyond your own self to do what you're not able to do. 
but God in you can do it. And this is going to be the protection mechanism that protects your heart. Just like in my memories last week, there was a dream I had when I was around a group of toxic people and they were just, oh, they were so hard on me. They were so unlovely. They were so unkind. And I had to be around them. And I, it just vexed me. And I would stay vexed in their presence. And when we got home, when Rich and I got home, uh, God gave me a dream. And in this dream, I was getting on a plane with them. And they were giving me poison. And I was drinking it. And Rich and I were about to board the pet plane and I was looking at Rich and we were in a warehouse and I was trying to talk with my eyes. Look, these people are toxic. I can't be around them. And then these two angels came to me in the dream and they said uh, that these people were very toxic and that my being in their presence was causing carnal nature in my members, the flesh to rise up and that for my own protection, I needed to be away from them at that time in order that I wouldn't have worldliness in my members and I would still love my enemies and I'd still bless them. And so there is that boundary that Holy Spirit will give you so that you're not in the midst of it all the time and that it won't have an effect on you to bring worldliness. And that's why we have to keep our hearts pure so that we're not projecting badness onto others and that we know that it's the spiritual dis-ease of the world that's in their members where they themselves have a need of relief of how bad they are to project their own badness onto other people in order to make themselves feel better. And so that is explained extensively and exhaustively in the Forbidden Fruit, the Spiritual Dis-Ease. So let's look at what Jesus talks about then in verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, the narrow gate. And so we're not going to be able to do all these scriptures today. We're going to stop with this scripture, but we're going to return to Matthew 7 tomorrow. Amen. So scripture says, enter through verse 13, the narrow gate for wide is the gate and spacious and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many are those who are entering through it. But the gate is narrow, contracted by pressure, and the way is straightened and compressed that leads away to life, and few are those who find it. Now, let me read verses 13 and 14 again. And this is where we're going to stop today. And then tomorrow, we're going to look at Jesus warning us of false prophets, false teachers, and their whole uh, deceptiveness through Satan and the kingdom of the world that's in their members is to draw people away. That's why you have to be careful of what teachings you're listening to because Satan can come as an angel of light and his messengers will appear as, appear as messengers of righteousness, but they are unsanctified. They aren't consecrated and so the Holy Spirit is not on them because they're not consecrated unto God. And instead, the spirit that they have of the world is that kundalini spirit, and it leads many to hell. <clears throat> so let's look at verses 13 and 14 one more time. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and spacious and broad is the way that leads a way to destruction, and many are those who are entering through it. But the gate is narrow, contracted by pressure, and the way is straightened and compressed that leads a way to life, and few are those who find it. So let's look at this scripture in Matthew 7, and let's look at the relation that it's talking about this particular gate in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. So I'm going to put pull up the Strong's Concordance and we're going to look at enter ye in. We're going to take our time. We're not going to go through this really fast. If it takes several days, so be it. But God really wants to unpack this teaching so that we have repentance and we have a consecrated body and the Holy Spirit, the power of Holy Spirit is in and upon us. Amen. 
And so let's look at this particular Greek word, enter therein. Iser homahi, Iser homahi, amen, Kimberly. Iser homahi, and it means to enter. It means to arise, it means to go through. And it comes from two Greek words, and the first one is ice. Oh my goodness. It is pronounced like I-C-E, spelled in Greek E-I-S. If you are in the coldness of the world, you better wake up and see the ice. Because the ice will try to look nice. Listen, Jesus was not nice. He was gentle. He was kind. He was loving. But nowhere in scripture does he say he was nice. Nice means that I will just act all sweet to you no matter what you do, no matter how much sin you are in, and I won't be real. No, you're in the ice. You got to get out and you got to see the ice, the coldness in your heart that comes in the package of judgment. That's the ice. Your heart's cold. How do you know? Everybody else is bad and you're the only one that's good. <laughs> Let me protect myself and keep all the bad people away. Saints, we have to humble ourselves, fast and pray. And again, people talk about, yeah, I got to repent every day. Let me tell you what. True repentance is knowing how close to hell you are that you wake up and you're on your face. And this is even when you're a Christian, when the Holy Spirit comes in the glory as in Isaiah 6, Acts 5, people are not going to be on their feet laughing and just, you know, giving their hands up to God you are going to be on your face and your sins are going to be in front of your face and you are going to feel just like I had for a whole week in July of 2012, a whole week. This happened to me. God said, Robin, you need to fast and pray. I'm bringing you into an accounting of the Lord. That's what he called it. He said, an accounting of the Lord. God had cut this woman with divination off of our ministry, would not let her return. And that whole week, he held me in a vision all week, fasting and praying every single day on my face, weeping, crying. He held me over the fires of hell and he showed me everything that had come out of my mouth because of that woman with divination that came into our ministry of the unclean thing that she was trying to do. And that's what Paul was dealing with in Acts 16, 16 through 19 was that same thing, you know? Oh, uh, uh, they're of God, but then the tongue of hell comes out and starts judging, accusing, dividing. Oh, no, no, no. That's of Satan himself, the father of lies, the divisive one, the cunning one that wants to bring division, backbiting, jealousy, James 3, 16, and 15 and 16, where there is every evil work, strife, all of that. That's what Satan wants to do. He wants to bring ice in the area. And so, Holy Spirit showed me that week, had me confessing every single day, had broken that woman's off of our ministry on Friday. That's why I love this couch. I've had this couch. It, I bought this couch with my tax return money. When I was a single mom in 1998, I brought, bought this couch, and there's no other couch that I want, and I bought upholstery for when it's time to upholster it. So I've had this couch since 1998. I want no other couch. And on this couch in 2012, God's holding me over hell in a vision all week, been repenting. It's Friday. It's lunchtime. I'm exhausted. I've been weeping. I've been repenting. I've been confessing my sins, getting it out of my members. And I kid you not, and this is in the Forbidden Fruit, the Spiritual Disease, and a, a variation of it is in my book, Clawing and Gnawing. All of my deliverances are in my book, Clawing and Gnawing, 
with the character Millie. And if you haven't recognized, I'm Millie in that book. In, in relation to uh, a deliverance she does with another woman, Dana, in my book, Clawing and Gnawing. And my body, I'm asleep. My body is lifted up on this couch. And I wake up finding myself lifted up. And all of a sudden, I felt a big hand come into my belly. And I felt three power cords pulled out of me. And my body gently came back down on the couch. And then the power of Holy Spirit flooded me. And I said, God, what was that? And he said, that spirit of divination from that woman had three cords in you. And was manipulating you. And I'm telling you, saints, a threefold cord cannot be easily broken. It w can be broken, but everybody always looks at it as only with God. A threefold cord can't be easily broken, you know, and it's, but you don't know what you don't know. The enemy can put three cords into you, and I've had three cords of a spirit of Jezebel through another woman that was controlling and manipulating me come out of my spine that was octopus tentacles that I audibly heard and physically felt. And my body was thrown. And then the power of Holy Spirit flooded me. And God showed me that it was that spirit of Jezebel, three cords, that had been manipulating and controlling me. I'm telling you, saints, in the invisible realm, if you give your members over to the world, to the unclean, that unclean is going to come in your body and it's going to start putting cords in you. And that's why you have to have clean hands and a pure heart, not judge others. You can't be in the ice. Amen. So this is where we're going to end right here. And we'll come back tomorrow. So enter, enter, I circle And that second word, or homa. Mahai means to calm. It means to have variations of coming to a place. And so we want to stay in this place. And ice, 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 the word ice in Greek, let me just make sure I get to that, means toward. It means unto. And so when we see the ice, we recognize. We're not consecrated. We don't have the Holy Spirit and fire. And so we seek in repentance that which we have ungodly judged by our own heart. And we repent and confess our sins. Every revival, Shantong, a decade revival, Tamor, Wales, those revivals started out with intense repenting where people saw the ice of their heart, the coldness that had been brought on by the world. And once they confessed their coldness, the world in them, the Holy Spirit came on them. Woo! Don't you feel the anointing on that? Hallelujah. So, God, we just thank you that you expose in our heart that which is of the world, that which is cold, the coldness, the waxing cold of our heart in your love. God, expose it. Expose where we're judging others. Expose where we think of ourselves more higher than we think of others. Expose it, God, and humble us. Hallelujah. Give us a hunger and thirst of righteousness for fasting and prayer, God, as you would lead us by Holy Spirit so that we are cleansed and cleanse our garments of the thing of the of the things of this world. In Jesus name. Amen. God bless you. I love you. And I'll see you tomorrow. We're going to enter the narrow gate. Very few are those who find it. God bless you. I love you.